Our awareness of those that are around us fades as we are drawn to the movement of the Spirit in our lives. Such was the experience of the nameless woman in Luke's Gospel. The woman who crashed a dinner party intent on finding Jesus, clinging to her alabaster jar filled with costly ointment, which she used to anoint Jesus' feet in worship. This story and the parable that follows it shows us the heart of worship. It shows us the connection between forgiveness and adoration, how God's love for us is shown in his forgiveness and how our love for God is shown in our adoring worship. At first blush, the setting of this story is quite unremarkable. First, we meet Simon, the Pharisee, a man with considerable status in his local community. He was hosting a meal in his home for Jesus and some other invited guests. Next, we meet Jesus, an itinerant rabbi whose reputation preceded him. He had attracted quite a following. Jesus accepted Simon's invitation to dinner, and so he entered Simon's house and he reclined at a low table, leaning on his left elbow, eating with his right hand, his body stretched out behind him, his bare feet exposed. And as the men ate together, they would engage in conversation with Jesus as he taught them and answered their questions. According to the custom of the day, others who were not invited to the meal were welcome to come and hear the visiting rabbi teach. They would enter through a side door and sit along the wall behind the invited guests who were reclining at the table. It was sort of like the insiders and the outsiders, if you wish. And finally, we meet a nameless woman whose reputation for immorality preceded her a woman who was known to have lived a sinful life. Her lifestyle, although not explicitly named, was nevertheless hinted at in the costly al alabaster jar of ointment that immoral women were known to use in their trade. A woman who slipped in the side door with one thing on her mind. She wanted to see Jesus. So the story has three characters, Simon the Pharisee, Jesus the rabbi, and the unnamed woman with a past. As we know, Jesus was not what we'd call a close friend of the Pharisees, for it seemed that they were always the ones who received the brunt of his criticism. But at least at this point in time, for the Pharisees, the jury was still out on Jesus. Was this man Jesus really an authoritative prophet? How could they tell? Was he really the Messiah that had been promised? The Pharisees felt challenged by Jesus' teaching. Over time, some Pharisees tried to find ways to catch Jesus in blasphemy or to find him breaking the Jewish laws. On the surface, one might assume that Simon had envisioned a friendly social luncheon. So how can we, the readers, know why Simon invited Jesus to dinner? What was his motivation? A few questions about social etiquette may shed some light on this answer. When Jesus arrived at Simon's house, where was Simon? Why did he not greet Jesus with a kiss of welcome and direct his servants to show honor to his guest? Where was the basin and towel for washing the guest's feet? Where was the sweet-smelling ointment for anointing the guest's head? Where was Simon? The story tells us that Jesus simply went to his house and reclined at the table. Perhaps Simon had forgotten the social niceties that a host would extend to his guests. Or possibly he simply disregarded them because he had an ulterior motive in inviting Jesus. Perhaps Simon was so focused on trying to catch Jesus out in his teaching that the, mere, the meal was merely kind of the social backdrop for what he had planned. 
But, as it turns out, the unforeseen arrival of this unnamed woman changed everything. When she slipped into the house, Jesus turned his attention to her. He met her gaze. He noticed her tears. He allowed her to touch him. He accepted her loving and extravagant act of worship. When the woman caught sight of Jesus, she stood behind him at his feet, weeping. In fact, she cried so much that she bathed his feet with her tears. Her heart was filled to overflowing and she sank to her knees. Not having a towel, she let down her hair and used her hair to dry his feet. She pressed her lips to his feet and kissed him over and over and over again. And then she anointed his feet with the smelling, sweet-smelling, costly ointment that she had brought with her. Simon himself observed the actions of the woman in stunned silence. I think we can relate to this reaction. Most likely, we'd have been speechless too. We might have felt very uncomfortable witnessing such an extravagant display of emotion and affection. For us Presbyterians who are known for doing things decently and in good order, it might have seemed somewhat un-Presbyterian, perhaps. Simon was certainly caught off guard by this unexpected interruption. And his silence spoke volumes. It seems clear that he was at once repulsed by this sinful woman's extravagant display of affection for Jesus, and at the same time, he was equally unimpressed with Jesus himself. The scripture tells us that Simon started thinking the problem through, logically. How could he recover the upper hand, so to speak? The woman's unexpected arrival could be used as a test case for Simon to use on Jesus. Simon said to himself, if Jesus were really a prophet, then he would know that this woman was an immoral woman. And in fact, this was true. Because later in the, in the scripture passage, Jesus says, the woman's sins are many. Simon's second premise flowed from his first. If Jesus were a prophet, and he knew that this woman was a sinner, then Jesus would have had nothing to do with her. However, if Jesus responded with love and compassion towards the woman, it would prove that he was not a prophet. And if he were a prophet, Jesus would recognize that this woman's presence in Simon's home would defile their purity. And according to the custom of the day, Jesus should have chosen to have nothing to do with her. You see, the Pharisees pride in themselves with being separate from sin. Even the name Pharisee is a derivative of the word separate. To be holy meant separating oneself from sinful people, sinful places, and sinful practices. But the notable phrase here is, the Pharisees prided themselves. The Pharisees prided themselves. The sin that jumped out at Jesus was not the woman's sin of immorality, but rather Simon's sin of pride. The very sin that Simon was blind to. What Simon didn't realize was that Jesus did know the woman's character, and yet he still loved and cared for her. And turning to address Simon, Jesus said, Simon, I have something to tell you. And at Simon's invitation, Jesus told him a parable. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? The answer was obvious. Simon had no choice but to reluctantly confess, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven will love him more. And Jesus said, you're right, you have judged correctly. Jesus' message was this, the one who was forgiven more, loved more. The one who was forgiven more, loved more. You see, the woman came to Simon's house for only one reason, so that she might see Jesus. 
She knew that although everyone else rejected her, Jesus would not reject her. The lavish love that the woman showed to Jesus was a response to God's overwhelming grace shown to her. And her love was a response to Jesus' forgiveness of her, an act of extravagant worship. And then, gesturing to the woman, Jesus rebuked Simon, saying, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Jesus went on to say to Simon, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Jesus rebuked Simon for his lack of hospitality and his disdainful attitude towards this woman. He rebuked him for his lack of love. Do you see this woman, Simon? For Simon, she was worse than a nobody. She was a mere interruption to his plans. But Jesus wanted Simon to see this nameless woman as he saw her. A woman with a shameful past, a humble present, and a promising future. A fellow human being, a precious child of God. A woman who was loved and forgiven. A woman who knew who Jesus was and who humbled herself before him. Then Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What did the woman's faith look like? It looked like extravagant love. Love born out of a profound gratitude for God's forgiveness and acceptance of her. Quite simply, the woman believed that if she came to Jesus, Jesus would not send her away. The Pharisees might be intimidating, but she didn't let fear of what others think lessen her resolve. And the remarkable thing is that of all the guests at the dinner, she was the only person that Jesus said, left the dinner forgiven. What this woman demonstrated that day was an example of extravagant worship. She threw caution to the wind and she expressed her love of Jesus in her own unique way, in a loving and humble act of washing his feet. Let's spend a moment to consider what this woman's worship of Jesus cost her. May I suggest that it cost her everything. And so it was extravagant worship. How do we know this? Firstly, the sinful woman had to come out of the darkness and into the light. Out of the darkness and shame of her sinful lifestyle and into the presence and light of God's redeeming love and forgiveness. Very simply, she had to come to Jesus in repentance, which she demonstrated by crying so much that her tears fell to the floor and washed Jesus' feet. Secondly, she had to humble herself. We know that a woman's hair was highly prized in their culture and considered to be like a crown of glory. And yet she let her hair down and used it like a towel to dry Jesus' feet. Jesus' feet, which were the most dishonorable parts of his body, she used her best to dry his worst. Thirdly, she disregarded the cultural taboo of a woman ministering to a man, of touching a man who was not her husband. If she had been a married woman, the action would have been punishable by death. And finally, she had to repurpose the expensive ointment in the alabaster jar 
into a love offering to Jesus, pouring it out and expending it on her worship of him. It was an act of repentance, literally of turning and facing the other direction. By using up her costly ointment on Jesus, she intentionally turned her back on her immoral lifestyle and she threw herself on his mercy. The application of Jesus' teaching is a challenging one for each of us. The question that Jesus asked Simon, do you see this woman, is a question that we need to ask ourselves. Do you see this woman? Do I see this woman? If we're blinded by the same attitude as the Pharisees had, the attitude that says we're better than, we're more worthy than, or we're separate from those people, then we've not really grasped the good news of the gospel, have we? Jesus calls both his audience and his readers to self-reflection with his own poignant example of how he treated the lowest of the low in his society. Have you considered that the nameless, immoral woman the one who was scorned and rejected by Simon, had most probably been used by men for the very services that gave her that label, an immoral woman. When we actually see this woman through the compassionate and loving eyes of Jesus, everything changes. And what we see is the woman's loving example of extravagant worship. Her worship of Jesus was focused and intentional, she came to worship him, ready to offer herself to him, ready to empty her alabaster jar to anoint his feet, Re ready to offer worship. And her worship was offered in a spirit of humility because she recognized that though her sins were many, Jesus' mercy was more. You see, the word worship means ascribing worth to God. It's done at the feet of Jesus, acknowledging his greatness and our unworthiness. It involves assuming an attitude of submission and respect for God, who is the object of our worship. And it involves doing everything for God in a spirit of love, adoration, and service. The example of the immoral woman gives us all an opportunity to examine our own hearts. Notice that the woman did not put on a layer of respectability when she approached Jesus. She didn't hide her true self, her vulnerability, her sinfulness, or her past. Her worship was simply authentic, heartfelt, loving worship. So let's come to Jesus like the woman did, with single-minded devotion. Let's not worry so much about what other people might think. Let's get, let go of the critical spirit that causes us to judge others or compare ourselves with others. Let's leave behind the sin of pride that blinds us, weighs us down, and distracts us from hearing what God is trying to say to us. Let's cast our burdens down before him, seeking his face in repentance. Let's give it all to Jesus, the good, the not so good, and the very bad. Jesus knows us, he sees us, he hears us, he welcomes us, he loves us, and most importantly, he calls us by name. Let's embrace the freedom that Jesus' forgiving love gives us and approach him anew in costly, extravagant worship to the glory of God. Amen.